How are we all travelling, okay? All right, I want you to give me, uh, have a think about how you're travelling, energy-wise, tiredness-wise. Uh, if you're smashed, right, if you went too hard last night and you're just going, uh, got nothing, right? Give me a flat line, okay, like flat line. If you're going, yeah, I'm going okay for last night on camp, yeah, I got some energy there, yep. And if you're going, what, we're not going for another week? Come on, right, I want a hand high up in the air. One, two, three, go. Excellent, okay, all right, so we need to pray and ask God to help us concentrate on his word one last time, let's do that. Uh, dear Father, we thank you for this wonderful week, we thank you for all the things that have happened here, all the experiences, all the ways that we've engaged with your word and committed our lives to you. We pray for one last burst of strength as we go to help us to concentrate on your life-giving word so that we can live for you and for your glory. We pray it in Jesus' name, Amen. All right, well, if you keep your Bibles open at Deuteronomy 32, that'd be great. And I wonder if you've ever had the experience of a song that you had to sing, but you really didn't want to. You probably haven't, but I have. So I went to a snooty high school, and I was in the choir for a couple of years. Uh, One of the key moments in deciding to quit was when we were told that at our end-of-year concert, we'd be singing traditional Aussie bush songs like The Road to Gundagai and Walting Matilda. And if that wasn't already cringeworthy enough, the choir master was a prim and proper Englishman and he insisted on prim and proper English pronunciation when we sang it. And so we had to sing Aussie bush songs like this. There's a truck winding back to an old-fashioned shack along the road to Gundagai. (laughs) Now, I start with this excruciating memory because you just never forget something like that. It is seared into my memory. You see, songs teach us powerfully. They get inside us and become part of us. Now, as an aside, bit of a rant, I was asked on the first night whether singing plays a part in staying focused on God and fighting idolatry. And I think absolutely yes. That is why the Bible is so full of songs. Because singing engages our whole selves, our minds, our emotions, our bodies, all of us. And theology and Bible knowledge shouldn't just be intellectual, They should drive us to feel passionately, I want to live for God. And so we want songs that stir our hearts like we've had this week. But it's also why we've got to be so careful with the songs we sing. Because our emotions are so powerful, if they point in the wrong direction, they can easily lead us to dangerous places. So, for example, in university, I liked this non-Christian girl. And I knew that it was just foolish to go after her, but the feelings were so strong, I just kept on justifying myself in developing things further. It was actually only an act of God's kindness, coupled with a really strong rebuke from a godly friend, that pulled my head in and stopped me from pursuing a relationship that would have had disastrous consequences for my faith. I hope if you're in that region at the moment, that this might have the same effect for you. But singing, I think, is in the same emotional ballpark. Uh, Did you guys know the heresy that almost destroyed the early church was Arianism, which taught that Jesus wasn't fully God, and almost everybody went for it. And you think, man, the Bible's so clear, Jesus is fully God, how did so many people get led down the garden path? The answer is songs. The guy behind it, Arius, wrote easy to learn, moving, repetitive songs. People sang them, they felt the emotional high, and they started to believe the words because they just felt so good when you sang them. Emotional songs, very powerful, can be very dangerous. Now, the answer is not, don't have emotions. Just have the truth. 
can you say a Sydney Anglican? <laughs> don't worry, I'm one too. I say this to myself as well. But I think that's sometimes how we respond, isn't it? We don't do emotion, we do truth. But actually, that doesn't work because we're emotional beings. It's just part of us. And if we go that way, we will lose our young people to churches and denominations that do emotion well, but theology badly through their songs. In fact, I think we're already seeing that start to happen. So what we need is songs and singing that are moving, but use emotion wisely in a careful, disciplined way so that our souls are engaged deeply with God's word. And that's what we have in Deuteronomy 32. Do you like that segue? It's pretty good, isn't it? Ran over. But it is striking, I think, that Moses finishes his sermons getting Israel ready for life in the land by teaching them a song. This is what they're to sing throughout their history until it's seared into their memory and becomes their very identity. This song in Deuteronomy 32 is meant to capture Israel's DNA and their journey as God's people. It's meant to be their national anthem. But like my bush songs, Israel probably wouldn't have wanted to sing it. You know, usually a national anthem tells its people, you're freaking awesome. Right? Australians all, let us rejoice, for we are young and free. What about America? Well, apparently, it's the land of the free and the home of the brave. Germany, 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 overall, overall the world. That one's a little bit scary, actually. <laughs> what about Israel's national anthem? Deuteronomy 32. Pretty much, you're wicked, stubborn, ungrateful rebels who are going to get stepped on. Right? Not the most inspiring national anthem in the world, is it? Not you're freaking awesome, but you suck. <laughs> uh, but unlike my bush songs, there was a great reason for Israel to sing Deuteronomy 32. This song draws all the threads of Deuteronomy together and shows us how in God's plan to save the world, the law was never meant to be a checklist to earn your way to heaven. The law was always there to drive sinful people to God's grace in Jesus so that those headed for death might be brought back to the God who is their life. Let me put it another way. Deuteronomy 32 tells us that the law leads to life with God by driving us to the grace of God. Let me say that again. The law leads us to life with God by driving us to the grace of God. That's the, the message of Deuteronomy 32. Now, it's a long chapter, so let me just sum up the song for you. In a nutshell, as was prayed earlier, the song teaches us to treasure God, the rock who judges and saves, because he has treasured his people. I'm going to look at it under three headings. The law teaches us to treasure God's goodness, Tremble at his judgment and trust in his grace. Okay, so first, the law teaches us to treasure God's goodness. So verses 1 to 4 give us the guts of the song. So it starts in verse 1 by saying, All creation, heavens and earth, need to hear this song. And why? Because the destiny of the entire world hangs on the covenant the relationship between God and Israel that Deuteronomy has spelled out. If the world is to be saved from sin, it will happen through Israel fulfilling the law. Make sure you remember that. Now, verse 2 then tells us what the song is meant to do. Let my teaching fall like rain and my words descend like dew, like showers on new grass, like abundant rain on tender plants. Quite a lovely little image there. And for a people who had just spent 40 years wandering in the desert, these words would have been so striking. Uh, I saw that Death Valley Desert in California recently had an unusually high amount of rain resulting in a desert super bloom, where things go from that, this, to this. Cue that. It's quite nice, isn't it? That's the kind of image that Moses is playing at. And the point would have been very clear. This song is meant to give life 
refreshment and blessing. Hope to the hopeless, life to the dead. But again, that's a bit of a surprise given how negative the song actually is. So how does that work? How can such a negative song give hope and life? Well, let's keep going. The main message of the song is in verse 3. We ought to treasure the goodness of God. I will proclaim the name of the Lord. O praise the greatness of our God. Verse 4 then gives us seven terms used to describe God's greatness. Uh, the biblical number of completion, seven, to match his perfect character. Uh, so the first one is the main theme, which is used five times throughout the song. God is the rock. Utterly solid, completely unmovable, the one foundation for life. I guess this makes Deuteronomy 32 the first rock song. Ah, yeah, I know. Hey. Yeah, it's Sunday. I'm just trying to keep things moving, you know. Uh, so he is the rock. And then the terms just keep tumbling out. His works are perfect. His ways are just. He is faithful. He does no wrong. He is righteous. He is upright. And he also loves and blesses his people abundantly. So have a look at verses 7 to 14. And they paint a beautiful picture of God's care lavished on Israel. Just look at the words from verse 10 onwards. He found them, shielded, cared for, guarded, carried aloft, fed, nourished, fed them richly with joy, strength, and life. He loves them. But this is actually more than just God's care for one particular nation. It's actually giving us a picture of salvation. That is, creation restored to the original goal and purpose it was made for. You see, you make something for a purpose, don't you? To fit a goal. You know? What do you make a sandwich for? Eating. What do you make a TV for? Watching stuff. What about creation? What was it made for? What were you made for? The Bible has a very clear answer to that. It says that God ultimately made everything, including you and me, for his own glory. Now, that might sound a little selfish until you understand what God's glory is. So remember what Mike said last night. Glory is how weighty, important, magnificent something is. Like, you know, a glorious sunrise, magnificent. Or if you're a cricket watcher, the glorious cover drive, right? It's magnificent, spectacular. You just relive it over and over again because it's so awesome. What's God's glory? What is his weightiness and magnificence? The Bible says it's his goodness. His goodness which is seen in the two main characteristics we've been banging on about all week from Deuteronomy, his love and faithfulness. Have a look at Psalm 100, verse 5. Psalm 100, verse 5, which says, Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Why? For the Lord is good. His love endures forever. His faithfulness continues to all generations. See, that's who God is at his core. He is the God of love and faithfulness. Sometimes you see the synonyms mercy and justice or grace and truth. But almost every mention of God's character in the Bible is connected to these terms. You know, they go together. You can't mention God without these being too far away. You know, a little bit like uh, Batman and Robin, Woody and Buzz. Or all I get to watch at the moment, really, with young kids, giggle and hoot. All right? God, love and faithfulness. That's who he is. Now, love in the Bible is much more than just romantic feelings. Okay? It's a fierce commitment to do good to someone else, no matter what the cost is to you. That's true love in the Bible, to, to do good to someone else, no matter what the cost to you. And faithfulness means you're reliable. You always keep your word and you never let others down. And so Psalm 100 verse 5 as well as the rest of the Bible says, that's God's glory. He is fiercely committed to doing good to others no matter the cost to him. He always keeps his word 
and never lets you down. And when you look at it that way, to say that we were made for God's glory is a wonderful thing. Uh, Jonathan Edwards is my favorite theologian. He was an American guy. And he uses a great illustration for this. He says, imagine a light like the sun and a mirror. And so God is like the sun. He is the source of glory. And he makes the world so that he can pour his love and faithfulness into us. That's why he made the world. But the process doesn't end there because the world, we are to receive his glory and then reflect it around the world to others so that the world is filled with God's good gifts and then we're meant to return that glory to him as we live lives of thanks and praise to him, the giver. And Edward says the world is meant to work when this There's this rebounding relationship of growing love and faithfulness between God and the world and the world and God, and that is true life. And you can see that's how the Song of Moses begins. It says, God has been so good to you, Israel, so treasure him and build your life in the land around his love, because as you do that, the light of his goodness will flow out and save a world lost in the darkness of sin. And brothers and sisters, that's still a call for us, his people, today. We should be a people who treasure the God who loves us and is faithful to us. Most of all in Jesus, but also in those other countless smaller tastes of his goodness to us. Uh, C.S. Lewis once put it this way. I think he, he put it really well when he said, take every experience of joy as a tiny taste of God's presence and love for you. And whether it's the sun on your face, or hearing your favorite song, doing your favorite activity, eating some tasty food, spending time with a friend, every facet of life is an opportunity to experience and thank the God who loves us. Hasn't this camp been awesome? Yes. Yes. Woo! What a wonderful gift of God it has been to be here. So I want you to take a second now, think over the past week, pick just one thing you really loved. Relive it for a second, feel that buzz, and then thank God for it. I want to challenge you to make this a habit in your life. When you have a moment of joy, stop. Thank the God who gave it to you and just revel in how good it is to live under him. That's what Moses says. And it's not just an optional extra in living for God. It's something we need to do and take very seriously because in the next section of the song, we see the consequences of of not treasuring God through his good gifts. And so the second point the song makes is that we are to tremble at the judgment of God. You see, when the song turns from God to Israel, the contrast is stark. Where God was totally devoted to them, they would go on to totally fail to keep his righteous law in devotion to him. Verse 5, they are corrupt, warped, Crooked, foolish, unwise, ungrateful. And it's all captured in that image of verse 15. Each word dripping with irony. Jeshurun, which is another way of saying Israel, grew fat and kicked. So Israel's pictured like a mangy mule that's been rescued from starving in the desert and given lush pasture. It gets really fat and heavy and sleek. But even as it eats, I don't know, Fresh grass, sounds appetizing, from its master's hand, even as its belly is being filled, it turns and kicks him. I think that's one of the best illustrations of sin I've ever heard. Kicking against the God who loves you and gives you life. It's completely dumb. It's completely evil. And we all do it, don't we? Is there even now an area in your life 
where you know you are kicking against the God who loves you. If there is, please bring it to God and repent now. Because if you turn away from the glory of the God who gives you life, the only prospect ahead for you is darkness and death. And we see this in verse 19 onwards. Moses gives Israel a preview of the future and it is not pretty. Verse 19, the Lord saw this and rejected them. So you go out, you know, take your shoes off or something, uh, find one of the big rocks around the place, and get good aim and give it a good kick, right? One of you is going to come off second best, right? And it's not the rock. And so if Israel kicked against their rock of salvation by breaking his law, they would find instead the boulder of his judgment falling on them in the covenant curses. Verse 22. For a fire will be kindled by my wrath, one that burns down to the realm of the dead below. It will devour the land. I think that's a better translation than earth at that point. It will devour the land and its harvests and set afire the foundations of the mountains. I will heap calamities on them and spend my arrows against them. I will send wasting famine against them, consuming pestilence and deadly plague. And on it goes all the way down to 35, where everyone stands condemned without excuse before God. It is mine to avenge. I will repay. In due time, their foot will slip. Their day of disaster is near, and their doom rushes on them. You go on in the, New Testament, uh, in the Old Testament, and that's exactly what happened to Israel. They forgot God, let go of his word, and grew so corrupt and ungodly that centuries later, God had to bring his terrible judgment crashing down on them. Now, this is a very heavy way to end what should be a very rousing finish to a camp, isn't it? But we need to hear it. God loves the world infinitely more than you or I ever will. But the God who loves the world deeply will also judge the world justly and condemn sinners for their sin. He did for Israel in history through Assyria and Babylon. He will for the whole world at the last day when we all stand before him. And Deuteronomy 32 says, Remember that day will come, tremble at it, and make sure you and those around you are ready for it. Now, sorry, that was very heavy, but we need to get there. Let's move on now. There are lots of passages in the Bible that speak about God's judgment in this way. What I want to show you from Deuteronomy 32 is especially how the law works in God's plan to get us ready for it. Because it does so, I think, in a way that we might not expect. See, I reckon lots of people think of the Old Testament law a little bit like my footy coach at school when he made us run the beep test. You, you know what I mean, the beep test, right? So you got, you know, cones 20 metres away, and you have to line up, and when it beeps, you have to run to the cone, run back again. There's a short gap, and then the beeps again, you have to run again and get back again, and it gets shorter and shorter and shorter. You have to go faster and faster and faster, and eventually... You're not good enough. You just can't make it. You're out. That's how a lot of people think of the law. It's this harsh, unattainable, cold set of rules God makes you keep. Eventually, you stuff it up, and it's like, oh, sorry, you didn't keep it perfectly. You're out. God gave Israel this righteous law. They stuffed up, didn't keep it perfectly, and so they got punished. But I hope you've seen through the talks and your work on Deuteronomy 6, that's not quite how the law works in God's plans, is it? It's not a dry list of rules we try to keep to get to heaven. I think a better analogy of the law is something like a litmus test for your heart. You know how a litmus test works in chemistry, if you've been to class, right? Uh, you stick the paper on something, and if it turns red, what is it? Acidic. If it turns blue, it's alkaline or basic. That's right. Um, but it's important to note the litmus paper doesn't actually change anything, does it? It just exposes what's there. That's a bit like the law. 
the law couldn't change Israel's heart. What it did, did was expose what's already there, whether their hearts were turned towards God in devotion or away from him in rebellion. Uh, let me switch analogies for the non-chemistry minded among you. Think about an allergy test. You know, you scratch a bit of stuff into your skin, like peanut butter or something, and if there's no reaction, whew, go ahead, knock yourself out on the craft smooth, no problems there. But if you get itchy and swell up or you die, <laughs> then you know inside you there's a problem. The peanut butter itself is not bad, right? It's good, especially in a peanut butter and jam sandwich. But if you're allergic to it, then coming into contact with it exposes there is a problem in you. And that's how the law worked. It's good. It shows us what true life looks like, being totally devoted to the God who is totally devoted to you. But as Israel came into contact with it, they failed to keep it. And that should have exposed for them, if I can put it this way, that their hearts were allergic to God. Now, if you're allergic to peanut butter, and it's simple, isn't it? Stay away from it. You won't have any problem. But if you're allergic to God in your heart, you are in deep trouble. Because he is the God who gives life. And away from him, there is only death. And so Israel's failure to keep the law should have exposed for them how hopelessly and helplessly far their sinful hearts were from God. And it should expose for us the same thing. Because we are no better than Israel. If we were there, we would have failed to keep the law just like they did. And if we examine our hearts honestly, we would see exactly the same symptoms as then. In and of ourselves, our hearts are hopelessly and helplessly far from God. That is what the law is meant to reveal. But the thing is, that doesn't mean the law failed. The law worked exactly how God wanted it to in his plan of salvation. See, verse 36 gives us the wonderful turning point of the song. In the midst of judgment, verse 36, the Lord will vindicate his people and relent concerning his servants. See, after judgment, God is going to turn back to his wayward people and offer them mercy and forgiveness. And when? Second half of verse 36, when he sees their strength is gone. When they're at their lowest point, when all their pride and self-confidence has been exposed and stripped away, when they finally see the depth of their need, the righteous God who is their judge will become their merciful saviour. Uh, Corrie ten Boom, who uh, lost so much uh, in living for Jesus and standing up for him in hostile times in war, uh, she once said, you'll never know Jesus is all you need until Jesus is all you have. And I think that fits perfectly with what Deuteronomy 32 is saying. It's only when you realize you cannot save yourself, only when you realize nothing in my hand I bring, that your hands are open to receive what God longs to give you. Well, that's pretty much the message of the song. But before we move on, I just want you to notice how the song ends in verse 43. It says, Rejoice, you nations, with his people, for he will avenge the blood of his servants. He will take vengeance on his enemies and make atonement for his land and people. And so somehow through Israel's experience of God's judgment and grace, the nations who are currently Israel's enemies will come to rejoice in Israel's God. That's a fascinating way to end, and just a little hint of the gospel to the nations. But let's now wrap it up and turn to your song. So I hope you can see now how the song of Moses leads us to the gospel of Jesus. 
Remember, the big message of Deuteronomy is that salvation will flow to the world when God's righteous law is fulfilled. It shows us that true life comes when we are totally devoted to the God who is totally devoted to us. But then it shows us also the desperate situation we are in. You see, as we hear the law spelt out in its context of what a life of love for God looks like, we should desire to live in line with it, but also see that because of sin, we can't. And so the law is not meant to be something that we try in our own strength to achieve. No, ultimately the law is given to show us how desperately we need God to rescue us. Uh, You know, when I was a kid, uh, my uncle took me to a park where you could feed ducks, and he told me, stay close because the riverbank is slippery. But I didn't really respect my uncle very much, and I just wandered off. And as I went, there was this 50-cent piece sitting halfway down the bank, I reached out for it, I lost my footing, and I slid down the steep bank through all the duck poo until I got to the bottom. And I kept trying to scramble my way up, but it was just too slippery. I just grazed my knees and slid back down into the muck. My uncle found me, and he said, grab my hand, I'll lift you out. But I was so proud and resentful, I knocked his hand away, and kept trying myself. And of course, it didn't work, it just made things worse. And I think that's a little bit like trying to take the law, as so many do, and save yourself by trying to keep it. You do that, and all you find is that it doesn't work. In fact, it makes the situation worse. When did things get fixed up for me? It's when I gave up trying to save myself, recognized that I'd done the wrong thing, and I needed rescue. I needed to stop rejecting him, but trust him. Take his hand and let his strength lift me out to safety and life. And that's what the law, properly understood, does for us. It shows us our deep, desperate need for God to rescue us and save us. But very, very quickly, I think the law also shows us how God would rescue us. Remember the message of Deuteronomy, salvation will flow to the world when Israel fulfills the law. Israel didn't. We don't either. But there is one Israelite who has. See, about a thousand years after Moses spoke these words, a man was born in Israel. And he perfectly responded to God's glory in the law. In fact, everything he did was of such righteousness. It was so full of love and faithfulness that it gradually dawned on people he's not just keeping the law, he's completing it and fulfilling it. He's bringing us the life the law pointed to but could not itself bring. Because when Jesus died on the cross... He showed us the ultimate saving expression of love and faithfulness. Love in offering mercy to undeserving sinners. Faithfulness in justly paying for our sins. And so it is in Jesus that we find fulfilled the law leading to life. All right. I think everyone's hot and tired. Let's wrap it up. Someone once said, the world can do almost anything as well or better than the church. You don't need to be a Christian to build houses, feed the hungry, or heal the sick. There is only one thing the world cannot do. It cannot offer grace. But brothers and sisters, Deuteronomy tells us that the one thing we can offer is the one thing everyone needs. And so what will be your song through your life? Deuteronomy 32 teaches us that the song of true life sounds like this. Treasure God's goodness to you. Tremble at his judgment at sin. And trust in his grace 
in the Lord Jesus. Make sure that's your life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your total devotion to us, sinful though we are. We thank you for the love and faithfulness and forgiveness that we have in Jesus. So please strengthen us to truly receive, reflect, and return your goodness in Jesus and to offer to the world the one thing we have, the one thing they need, the grace of the Lord Jesus. Amen.